This happened in the summer of 1993. My dad and his girlfriend, now my stepmother, were living in Cardiff in Wales in the city centre. Not a particularly high crime area, but a lot of student accommodation. At 6am, my father gets up and walks to the kitchen to get his morning coffee. As he walks into the kitchen, he is welcomed by a random man sat at the kitchen table staring at him. Being the cool collected guy he is, instead of freaking out, my dad asks the guy if he wants a cup of coffee. The breakfast intruder agrees and joins him. A few minutes later, my dad's girlfriend comes in. She also doesn't freak out and offers to make him some breakfast. So the three of them sit down, eat breakfast and have a chat for 20 minutes or so. Apparently the conversation was a bit weird and nonsensical, but they didn't say what it was about. After they finished breakfast, they escort the breakfast intruder through the front door. After he leaves, they start freaking out and naturally call the police. The police come, take statements and do their thing. Later in the day, they're contacted by the police saying they've apprehended the breakfast intruder. It turns out the guy was a paranoid schizophrenic. He was breaking into odd-numbered houses on the street. My dad was the second house he'd entered. The first one he went into was empty. This was where he left his tools, a sawn-off shotgun, and a lot of ammo. His plan was to shoot anyone in the odd-numbered houses on the street. When the police arrested him, he told them that my dad and his girlfriend were the nicest couple he'd ever met, and that had stopped him carrying out his plan. When people say I'm too laid back for my own good, I tell them this story, and it never fails to shut them up. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled frequently, I was left home quite often. I'm going to do my best to describe the layout of the house so you can better understand the situation. My house is pretty small since it is just my father, my dog, and me living in it. There's a long hallway full of full-sized windows separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog always loved to look out the windows, so we always kept them open for her to look out of. I'm the last room at the end of the hallway. In between the two rooms is my bathroom and a spare room. So now, on with the story. It was around 11pm when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a long day. I was mindlessly dancing around my house, getting ready for bed. I hopped in my shower, not knowing what was coming ahead. And of course, like a cringeworthy horror movie, my dog starts aggressively barking up a storm. With my excessive knowledge of how it turns out for the girl in the movies, I go out and explore. I head to my room to throw some clothes on while my dog is still shitting a brick. Months before, I'm not sure how I managed to break my door handle, but you don't have to twist the knob to open it. All it needs is a small push. Scared shitless, I barely managed to put a shirt on when my dog opened the door. I look to see her enter my room while in the midst of barking, and that's when I saw it. There is only one window that has vision to the opening of my room, and in the corner of it, I saw a face. A face so seemingly sinister that I can still see it years after. It was dark out, so I took a second to comprehend what I just saw, but when I finally realized it, I screamed. My dad owns lots of guns, so when he heard me scream bloody murder, he ran out with a pistol. He asked me what happened, and I could barely mutter what I saw. He ran outside to see if the man with the terrifying face was still near. We stood out there for a minute, scanning the area. A man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction, from about a hundred yards away. I knew it was him. I got that feeling in my stomach that you cannot mistake. It was like he was trying to cover up that he was there by coming from a different direction. That bastard didn't fool me. You better stay the fuck away from my daughter. You see what I have here? You know what this does. My dad was holding up his gun. I could have sworn he was gonna shoot. 
The man brushed these threats off easily. Fuck off, old man, he said. My dad and I went back inside. He went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I couldn't sleep a wink. I kept thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of the threats to him. We called the cops the next morning and they came out and scoped out our house. They looked around the house trying to calm me down, but I was still pretty shaken up. An officer went to the front yard, and that's when he saw it. In front of the windows in the long hallway, there were small bushes, nothing much. The officer went to the window that had the view of my room, and there it was. If he tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, he failed. There were indents in the dirt, right in front of the window. The officer said he knew where he needed to look for you. And it seems as if he has come here more than once, due to all the broken pieces of bush and the divots in the ground. It turns out he was the nephew of my old neighbor. He had been staying there for a few months. He never got arrested, never got in trouble, probably barely got a slap on the wrists. But at least he was gone now. How long had he been watching me, I'll never know. All I know now is I keep my door shut, and I never keep the blinds open. So it was a Friday night. Earlier that day, my parents had left to go to an important business meeting early Saturday morning. The city where the meeting was happening was a long way away, so they left early to get to the city around 6pm and stay at a hotel. So I was left at home to watch my two little brothers and my little sister. I was 15 at the time and this was in 2017. So this night I was watching Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone because my siblings really like Harry Potter films when all of a sudden we heard banging on our back door. I got up to see. I saw one man at the back door and two men at the kitchen window. They were all wearing black hoodies. I turned all the lights off and told my siblings to get upstairs. I turned off the living room light and we headed upstairs. As we were doing that, another man approached the front door and started banging on it. We went upstairs and hid in my wardrobe. The men came in and we heard them come upstairs. I heard one of them say, We just want to kill you, so there ain't no point in hiding. My siblings were starting to sob. We heard the men go into our parents' bedroom and then I decided to escape. I had lived in that house for my whole life up until that point, so I knew where the creaking parts of the floor were. I told my siblings where they were and to avoid them. We made it downstairs and I unlocked the door. However, I accidentally swung it open and it hit the wall. I turned around and saw one of the men at the top of the stairs looking at us. He pointed at us and started screaming. It wasn't like a scared scream, but an alert scream. I ran out with my siblings, and as we got out, I heard the man's scream turn into a high-pitched psychotic laughter. We started running to our neighbor's house, which was a good distance away. We saw the four men chasing us. Luckily, the neighbors let us in and called the police. We waited for the police to arrive, and then we went back to our house. The four men were nowhere to be found. There was nothing else to report apart from two broken doors and windows. This story starts off with me getting home from high school on the bus. I made it home and saw that my mom wasn't there. And since my dad was at work and my brother didn't get out of school until later, I was the only person there. I put my backpack down and go to untie my shoes, and some guy walks out from the hallway. I go into Occam's razor mode and assume that this is some sort of handyman and repair guy, being as we had moved in recently, and had been getting a lot of repair work done to fix the half-assed DIY electrical, plumbing, and paint jobs left behind by the previous owner. Additionally, he was wearing some sort of tool belt, and it fits the general repairman look. My mom's usually around when we have people working on the house, so I assume that my mom must not have left long ago, and that she would be back soon. I nonchalantly tell the guy that my mom should be back soon, 
and he mumbles something like, thanks, and he leaves out the front door to what I assume is a repair truck. It's at this point that I text my mom asking when she'll be back, and who the guy was in the house. She asks if I'm joking, and it's only at this point that I come to realize that I was sitting on the couch talking with the guy burgling our house. At this point, the guy was long gone. Luckily, my mom was only a couple of minutes away at a store down the road. She gets back and we call the police. They take a look around, but nothing actually went missing. Nothing ever really came of it. I'm honestly glad it went down the way it did. I only knew what happened once it was already over. This guy had put himself between me and the front door. I'm not really sure what freaked out fight or flight me would have done. I also can't imagine what the guy was thinking when I basically just let him walk out. While I was in college, my father came down to help me move into a new apartment complex. The new place was about five stories high, and each level had an identical layout with apartment units along indoor hallways, which were accessible from an elevator to the parking garage below. I was the last one of my three roommates to move into the new place, so there was already some furniture and decor, with which I was not familiar. My father and I were unloading the truck from the garage below, so we would take the elevator to my place on the fifth floor with each load. As we carried my big mattress into the apartment, I had to set it down for a moment to readjust my grip before we went through the door to my new bedroom. That's when I actually looked at my surroundings and thought, Huh, I don't recognize that couch. And where did the half-empty bottles of Jack Daniels on the counter come from? Right then, I also remembered that nobody else was home, but I could hear the shower turning off and a man's voice timidly saying, Hello? From the bathroom. As it dawned on me, that both of us were in the wrong unit. My dad just shouts, Abort! Abort! He grabs his end of the mattress and shoves me in the bed back out into the common hallway. We realized we'd gotten off on the wrong floor. The unit that we had entered was the floor below mine. Luckily we made it back to my floor before the poor guy from the shower ever saw us. Fast forward a couple of months, and I had kind of forgotten about this whole event. One of my roommates had gotten to know the guy in the unit below us. They would sometimes come up to our place to smoke or weed. One night, we were all hanging out in the living room with Andrew, one of the downstairs guys. It came up in conversation that we liked the great security in our building, because this was a bigger city than any of us were used to. Andrew agreed in general, but he then told us about this one time he totally freaked out because he was in the shower and he swears he heard multiple people in his apartment thumping around. They were talking to each other right outside the bathroom door. He had always wondered if he'd hallucinated the whole thing, because when he emerged from the bathroom, nothing was stolen and nobody was there. At that point, I was trying to blend into the terrible 1980s wallpaper as my face turned red. My roommates all knew and loved the story of my dad and I breaking into the downstairs neighbor's apartment and then running away like total creeps. Of course, one of my girls doesn't miss a beat and said, Oh yeah, that was Gina and her dad trying to move her mattress into your bedroom. After I explained the whole situation, Andrew said he was ultimately relieved to learn it wasn't someone with malicious intent, but I never was able to shake my new nickname, Creeper G. So there's my story, how my dad and I were inadvertently the local sketchballs. I live in a house that's been altered because it's student accommodation, so from the outside, you would think that my bedroom is a living room, because who sleeps on the bottom floor in a house, right? So, it was about 3am, mid-August and very hot. I was in bed scrolling through my phone, and my ex was asleep next to me. I was sleeping with the window open because of how warm it was, and the blinds usually make a quiet rattling noise from the soft breeze blowing through them. On this particular night, I heard the noise, and it sounded slightly different from usual. So I look up. 
My bed is right by the window, and my head is almost right below it. I see someone's hand poking through the blinds, parting them to look through. I immediately sat up and jolted to the other side of the bed. I shouted to my ex, Wake up. Wake up. Someone's trying to climb through the window. He jumped up and shouted, Oi! And whoever it was immediately bolted off down the road. I honestly felt like I was in a horror movie. I've never slept with the window open again, of course. This happened in the early 90s when I was a junior in high school and was home on Christmas break. It was in the middle of a weekday and I was home alone when the phone rang. When I answered, a man asked for me by my first and last name. He then said, This is Randy. Whatever else he was saying was unintelligible, but the last part he said was, Company. And I was calling too. I tried to interrupt to have him repeat his name and company again. He said it very quickly and unclearly, but he ignored my question and asked if I had been looking for a job. I wasn't, but I was young and sort of wanted to see what the job was going to be, so I hedged a bit. Randy then told me that he was hiring models for commercials, and that someone had given him my name. I laughed because, number one, that sounded completely fake, and number two, I wasn't exactly swimming in model contracts. When I told him that I believed he must be mistaken, he replied, No, I think you're very pretty, Tessa. While that comment may not seem that disturbing, it stopped me in my tracks. He had initially said that I had been recommended to him, but now he was speaking as if he had seen me. And at that moment, I just knew in my gut that something was very wrong. Unfortunately, I had not yet learned to get my brain and my gut on the same page, so while I wasn't buying any of what he was selling, in order to be polite, and maybe... Just in case there was some cash and an ego boost to be had, I said, Okay, how about you just give me your number and I'll talk to my parents and get back to you. I knew if he was legit, he'd have no problem giving me his number. Also, my brother had been asked to do a commercial or a print ad or something a few years before. I knew that my parents had to sign some forms because he was underage. But of course, Randy failed both of my tests. He resisted giving me his number or allowing me time to talk to my parents. He encouraged me just to agree right then. So I promptly said, No thank you, and I hung up. Within seconds of hanging up, the phone rang again. When I answered, I'll never forget what he asked me. He started asking me about different sexual acts. That escalated quickly, as I stood stunned in silence. He repeated a question and then moved on to similar ones. What made it unnerving, besides the obvious, was that it didn't sound like a prank call at all. Even though his comments were sexual, he sounded almost angry. I was safe in my home and it was just a phone call, but it made me feel like I was in danger. I hung up of course, but he called continuously, so continuously in fact that every time I tried to pick up the phone to call my mom, he would either be on the line when I picked up the phone, or the phone would begin ringing again. By this point, I wasn't answering the phone, and if he was on the line when I picked up, I would hang up quickly, but he was getting angrier and angrier. His comments were taking a darker turn. What started is asking me invasive sexual questions had turned into comments about how he'd like to harm me. I was finally able to get through to my mom, and she called the police. They didn't seem to take it really seriously, or even act like they could do much. I didn't recognize his voice, and it wasn't a teenager. It was obviously a grown man. They felt that it was just someone messing with me, and it would just fade out on its own. And for a time, I guess, it seemed like they were right. That first day, he called constantly for a few more hours, but then the call stopped, and although it was very disturbing, it 
it seemed to be over. Some time passed and I quit thinking about it, but then spring break rolled around. It was the same scenario as before. I was home from school on a weekday and I was alone. The phone rang and when I answered, he launched straight into the vile sexual talk. I hung up and we began the same cycle as before, with him calling constantly and me trying to time it just right so I could pick up the phone between calls and call my mom. Every time I hung up on him, he got angrier and the things he said became more foul. This time, he started reciting my address and talking about paying me a visit. Not only did it feel very threatening, but it was so confusing. Who in the world was doing this? Why would a grown man I didn't know make these calls? Not just once, but two times months apart. How did he have so much information about me? None of it made any sense. When I was finally able to call my mom, she called the police again. The officer took it a bit more seriously. They asked if we wanted to put a tap on the phone. We agreed. They told us that the process is as follows. It would take 24 hours to get with the phone company and get it active. Once active, it would be there for 60 days. If there were no issues in 60 days, it would be removed. But if there were an issue, then we'd have him. Just like before, the calls continued throughout the afternoon, but they had stopped by the time my parents got home. I got some the next morning after my parents had left for work, but by the time the 24 window had passed, they had stopped. And once again, things were quieter for another few months. This cycle continued over the course of the next year. It was quiet until midsummer, then again until Christmas break of my senior year, and when he called, the pattern was almost always the same. The calls usually started out with him being more polite, but as soon as I recognized his voice and hung up, they became progressively more angry and violent. They always came when I was alone and began continuing the exact moment that my mom or dad pulled into the driveway. We would put the tap back on the phone each time, but the calls never continued for more than 24 hours in a stretch, and there was always at least 60 days in between episodes. The content of the calls, however, got increasingly more personal. He would regularly mention my address, and eventually began talking about my clothing. But then, he started mentioning things that I owned but didn't actually wear, this obviously took our level of fear up a notch. By this point, because he would call right up until someone else got home, we knew he had to be in a position to see our driveway. But every day after school, I would let myself in the side door using a key that was hidden outside. It was extremely well hidden and you'd have to be positioned in just the right spot to ever get to see me use it. But if you were hiding and watching, then it was possible. It became impossible not to think he may have been in our house, in my room, and that thought was simply unbearable. We obviously stopped leaving a key outside, but the very nature of the cycle, short bursts of intense contact, followed by months of nothing, made it hard to know what to do. He clearly knew how to avoid the trace, he was motivated enough to keep contacting me over such a long period of time, and he was controlled enough to wait for long stretches in between calls. I had never been someone who scared easily, and my dad didn't want me to lose that. He started keeping the guns in the house loaded and taking me to the shooting range. After Christmas, a quiet few months passed as always. I had stayed alert for a week or two, and then I quit thinking about it. On the first day of my summer break, I was home and in a great mood when the phone rang. Expecting a call from my best friend, I said, Hello? And I heard, I'm calling about the job you applied for. This is Randy. Followed by more unintelligible words. I actually had been applying for jobs, but as I said to the man, From where? It hit me that this was the exact conversation we had the first time he called. I hung up and prepared myself for another awful day. The calls kept coming and, as usual, in the process of trying to call my mom, 
I would end up on the phone with him. The things he would say got worse after every quiet spell, and by this time, he was describing how he was going to murder me. More than the things he was saying, the rage in his voice triggered a real fear in me. I was having trouble getting the line open long enough to call my mom. I knew he was watching close enough to be watching the house. I got the gun out of the closet, and I sat there by the ringing phone. I was wanting to call my mom, but I wasn't wanting the chance to hear his voice again. I wasn't panicky, but I was crying and definitely scared. And then, I was done. Just simply done. I picked up the phone and he launched into his sixth spiel, trying to get as much in as he could before I hung up again. But I didn't hang up. I'm not sure why. I didn't have a plan, but I sat there silent for a few minutes and let him talk. And when he said that he could be at my house in less than two minutes, without thinking about it for a second, I said, Come on over. The door's open. I then hung up the phone, walked over and unlocked and opened the front door, leaving just the screen door closed. With my gun in my hands, I sat down on the couch facing the door and waited. He never came, and he never called again. There is zero doubt in my mind that if he had walked onto that porch, I would have shot him, without hesitation. I still have no idea who it was, or why, or whether it would have escalated beyond phone calls. I went off to college, and my parents eventually moved out of that house, so I suppose it will forever be a mystery. I trust that God will give him what he deserves, but I definitely learned that people who feed off your fear disappear quickly when you quit being afraid. This happened when I was in the second grade of elementary school. One night, my parents had to leave to attend a wake and they left me home alone to house sit. They told me that I was in charge of the house. I was to eat dinner, take a shower, and go to bed. They said that they would be back after midnight. I'd never been alone in the house before. It was really strange, but I wanted to enjoy this newfound freedom. So I was watching TV and feeling really powerful, as I could choose whichever channel I wanted. We live in the rural countryside of Kyushu, our neighbors are a couple of minutes away, so nights are usually very calm and quiet. I think it was about 8 or 9 o'clock. I had just finished watching a TV show, and the news came on. Boring, I thought. I guess it was time to take a shower and hit the hay. I was contemplating this massive decision while reading a manga comic laying down on the bed. Then, I heard a knock at the door. Oh, my parents came back early, I thought as I went at the door. I looked through the frosted glass, and I saw the big shadow of a person there. My mom was only around four foot nine, so it couldn't have been her. Maybe it's my dad, I assumed. I called out. Hello? A deep male voice replied. Hi, little girl. Is your dad home? My dad was a bit of a drinker, and he often hung out with Boo's house. I thought that this might have been one of his pals or something, so I carelessly responded. No, he's not here. He's at a funeral. There was a short pause. And what about your mother? I didn't know what to say. I knew my mom hung out with her friends and they went drinking too, so maybe this guy knew both of them. But something told me not to reply. I felt a bit suspicious. What do I do? I thought that no matter what I would answer with, I might end up making another mistake or getting into trouble somehow. Mom's not home either, the voice persisted. This was so strange. We never usually had people coming to the house at this time of night. This wasn't right. There was something about his voice too. It didn't sound like the local accent. This wasn't good. I felt extremely anxious, and I couldn't bring myself to say anything in response. Are you alone in there, little girl? I began to cry silent tears while standing still and silent. 
Can't you open the door for me? I have something I have to give to your dad. I'm just here to drop it off. He said in a voice so extremely sickly. The kind of voice you hear when you're trying to coax someone into doing something. I mustered up enough strength to reply. Can you come back tomorrow? He didn't reply. He just started to violently turn the doorknob. I understood this man's intentions now, and it felt like an arrow of ice went through my heart. My throat closed up and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't scream. Then came the sound of his fist, punching the frosted glass. Open it, he roared again and again. Please stop, I pleaded. It's so loud, I said. Then my brain kicked into gear, and I ran into the living room and grabbed the house phone. I didn't even know the number of the place where my parents were at. My parents had told me about people who would call the police when they don't need their help. Hoax calls. I was nervous, thinking I might get into trouble for one of these calls. While I was panicking about what to do, I heard the glass shatter in the hallway. He had breached the door. A horrible, thick arm shot through the hole. I remember he was wearing a jet black jumper. I screamed for help. I remember thinking this was more like a scene from a movie, not from real life. The arm was searching for the lock. While the arm was desperately probing for the lock, I heard another scream coming from outside. It was someone shouting my name. Someone shouting that they called the police. I wandered over to the door and I saw the owner of the new voice. I jumped for joy. It was the voice of the older lady who lived next door. She had heard all the commotion and came to see what was going on. As she shouted that she called the police, the man ran for it. I let her in. I was inconsolable. I just bawled my eyes out the whole night through. The police arrived about 30 minutes before my parents came back. When my parents did come back, they apologized again and again for leaving me by myself. In the end, we didn't know who the intruder was. My dad assumed it was a robbery attempt. Just as a side note, our town is located along the East China Sea in Kyushu, and there are a lot of suspicious ships around the ports. In addition, my hometown is famed for many unsolved missing person cases. We never found the man, but I often replay that moment in my head over and over. Thanks to that man, I have had countless sleepless nights. I don't like to think about what might have happened to me, if my neighbor hadn't been there. We've become very close with our neighbors after this, and my parents never let me house it again. I'm 17 years old and from Canada. Where I live is quite isolated. Not isolated to the point where I'm in the middle of nowhere, but there aren't many people in my town. A few months ago, this really old couple who had been our neighbors since I was born were moved into a care home and their house was put up for sale. My dad had a friend at the house selling firm, so he knew when it got sold. It was sold about a month after they moved out. My mom and dad were working, but I was at home, being as the whole pandemic thing caused me to get homeschooled. Someone knocked at my door. I'm not really a fan of social interactions, especially when home alone. Because believe me, I've watched enough scary shit to know. After about four knocks, I knew they wouldn't stop, so I went downstairs and opened the door. But I made sure I was still on the phone call to my friend, and I made it clear I was talking to someone, as when I answered I said, Give me a second, Hunter. Just as a precaution. I answered the door to an older guy. He looked rough, but a type of rough that was well-groomed, if that makes any sense. I said what's up, and he explained that he's the new neighbor. I didn't know what to say, so I was just like, Oh hey, what's up? He asked if he could come in, because it was snowing pretty bad outside. He just came up to inspect his property, knowing my mom would shout at me if I got off on the wrong foot with the new neighbor. I let him in. He just sat on the sofa while we talked. He had questions about the neighborhood. After about ten minutes, he asked if he could use the bathroom 
and then said he would be on his way. I said, sure, it's upstairs on the left. He went up, and I was still on the phone to my friend. He was up there for about five minutes, so I shouted up, Hey, are you okay? Not that I was concerned, I just wanted this guy gone. He replied, yeah, it's all smooth sailing up here, or something like that. When he came down, he wasn't wearing his jacket anymore. Instead, he had rolled it into a ball in his hands. At the time, I didn't take note, but the more I think about it, the more sense it makes. I see him out and say goodbye, and that's that. I talk to my friend on FaceTime and then go upstairs to my room. Now, I have OCD so I know I'd never leave my door open just a bit. I think to myself, what has this guy done as I look around? The only thing I noticed that was out of place was my drawer. The middle one was just a bit open too. I check it and all my underwear is gone. I check my dirty laundry basket behind my door. All of my dirty underwear are gone from that too. I call my mom and ask her about the underwear and if she's done some laundry. She said no. I freak out and I call my dad and ask him about the neighbors. He says, Oh yeah, I've spoken to the dad. British guy. Lovely fella. My heart sunk as I realized I let a random guy in my house. And God knows why he wanted my underwear. I haven't seen him since, and I haven't told my parents about it as it's pretty embarrassing. It only adds fuel to my mom's argument that I can't go to college as I'm too immature and unable to take care of myself. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and studying in Paris, France. I was going home from uni. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way home. That day, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking at me intensely. I was used to unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time, his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like prey being stalked. I decided to get off the bus a few stops early. I wanted to avoid him and didn't want him to see where I usually got off. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button and waited until the last moment to stand up and leave. I didn't notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was feeling the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I looked over my shoulder, and there he was, a few meters behind me. I had the distressing feeling his eye had just looked away the moment I turned. I walked into a shop, took my phone out, and pretended to make a call. When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited and made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back in the busy street. I zigzagged, crossed the street at every crossing. Finally, I believed that him getting off at the same stop as me was just a coincidence. When I reached my building, I looked back one last time, and there he was. His alarming gaze on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbed the stairs four at a time. I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, locked it and froze. My intercom was ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed all the buttons one by one, hoping someone would open. But now, now he knew my name. Gabrielle. Oh shit. I felt like a deer in the headlights. Frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just want to talk to you. Somehow, I could not move or speak. Come to the window, he added. Look at me. You'll see. I am not a bad guy. Something clicked. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. I was not going to make that mistake. I hung up in shock. I waited by the door without moving for what seemed like hours. When I finally managed to calm myself, I called my long-distance boyfriend. Called the police. 
he said immediately. Why didn't I call the police? I don't know. Today, it would be the first thing I would do. The fear of making a big deal out of something not important, perhaps. What an idiot I was. I called my best friend instead. I didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while, I felt better, safe. We started laughing, and suddenly, the intercom rang again. Two hours had passed since I'd come home. I answered. Gabrielle, said the voice. Open, please. I still remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He was there all this time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabrielle, let me in. I am so thirsty, he said. Just give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. Curled up in a corner in the recovery position, terrified, I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared to even breathe. The intercom rang again, and again. I didn't answer this time. I crawled to the sofa and fell asleep in exhaustion. I heard the intercom ring one more time in the middle of the night. I woke up in the morning, afraid to leave my apartment. I called my dad, who came to pick me up. There was no one in the hall, but there was a note in my mailbox. Gabrielle, I am a nice guy. You should have opened to me. Was written down on the note. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened, and of course told me that I should not hesitate to call them. My dad called a locksmith to install a digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors asking not to open the door to anyone they did not expect. He sat in the cafe in the front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. I never saw that stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from uni every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand and look back every few meters. Today, I am still very observing of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I'm not expecting someone. So, people, if you find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be an idiot like me. Be safe, everyone. For almost a few years now, end of August 2019 to be exact, I had moved into an apartment in a different city because my mother who I lived with in my hometown passed away from cancer. I have moved here with my long-term boyfriend and one other roommate. We all absolutely love it here. The location is great. It's a 15-minute bike ride from my university and it's located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms and that kind of thing so we have pretty much everything we could possibly need to survive within walking distance. However, after just a month or two of living here, someone has started to ring my doorbell at exactly 11.05pm semi-regularly. Sometimes every day, sometimes every other day, sometimes there's a week in between, and sometimes there's a couple of weeks in between. But it is always around 11.05pm, and every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is. Except for one time, but I will get to that in a bit. At first, I thought it was friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell. But after around the fourth time, I grew suspicious. And after more than those four times, I started noticing that it always happens at either exactly 11.05pm or a couple minutes earlier or later. My boyfriend and my roommate both work at bars so they work until very late and would usually only get home around 2am. So each time it happened, I was always alone at home. It started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they kind of shrugged it off and said it was probably a wrong dial, much like I thought at first. But when I told them that it has happened so many times, and sometimes even daily, 
They didn't really believe me, and that I was just being paranoid and spooked. However, one night, when the doorbell rang again, I answered the intercom, asking who it was. I heard heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked at that moment. I was again home alone, and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't make up from the breathing if it was a man or a woman, but I heard a strange mumbling or whispering, and then it was dead silent. They had appeared to have left. I put my apartment door on a double lock after that. I was so scared and spooked out. Thankfully, my roommate got home a little earlier that night, around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang. He could tell how upset I was. Now with the whole pandemic crisis, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore. They now also witnessed the frequent door ringing at 11.05 p.m. So now they do believe me and agree that it's very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down at where our apartment building's main front door is. But because there's a shop underneath us that always has the awning out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend, and roommate, would go over to the balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. I've also asked my neighbors from my apartment building if their doorbell gets rang so often, but the ones that I asked all said it's never happened to them. So a few weeks ago, my roommate decided to do some investigating. He went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m., standing across the street. He pretended to have a smoke while keeping an eye on the door, he said he did see a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building. He slowed his pace down significantly as soon as he approached our door, but when he spotted my roommate looking at him, he quickly walked away. We aren't completely sure if that's the door ringer, but that was very, very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't gone off at night since that day. I'm hoping that maybe it will stop now, but there is a possibility that it will continue again in a few weeks. This all happened roughly five years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it's happened. I'll start off by saying that at the time I was pretty young, single, and very keen to have my first experience with a guy. I spent a while looking through dating apps, talking to a few people, until I finally came across a guy who seemed interesting. We had a lot of things in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with them, since we had been talking for almost a month. Now, even though I was only young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was, and still am, a very cautious and paranoid person, but for some reason that day, I made what possibly could have been one of the worst decisions of my life. I invited him to come spend the night at my place. My parents were away for the weekend, and I had the place to myself. It seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived around three to four hours away from my place, yet he was eager and almost desperate to come see me, so he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11 a.m. The whole time he was driving to my place, I had the sickening sense of doom, almost as if something was going to go very wrong. I almost texted him a couple of times to tell him I wasn't interested anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. I jumped up as I heard his car pull up, and I expected to be greeted by a smile once I opened the door, but he pushed his way through and continued to stare at me blankly all whilst my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never, ever do to anyone. Things instantly seemed extremely odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom, and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me, which I hesitantly went along with, as this was my first experience with a guy, especially as he was almost six years older than me, so I was pretty tense. Fast forward to a couple of hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which did confuse me as it was only 5pm, but I told him it was fine and I would continue to watch movies by myself downstairs. After an hour or two, 
I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around and the sound of him talking. So I made my way upstairs and opened my door to find him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed, where he sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes and put his hands lightly around my neck. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, which worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat and said, does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am or what I look like or anything? I instantly answered, saying that my sister and friends who live nearby knew. This was a complete lie, as I don't have a sister, and my friends were unaware. But something inside of me forced me to say it. After a few minutes of awkward silence, he stood up, gathered his things, and I noticed that in his backpack he had tape, rope, and handcuffs, which at first didn't concern me as I knew he was into that stuff, but I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden he said, I think I'm gonna head home. I have a long drive and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate to let him out of my front door, as I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to make any eye contact or say goodbye. He raced off down the street as soon as he got into his car. I ran back to my room to check if he had left anything as he left in a hurry and I found a note on my desk with the words, being nice is what saved you. At the time I had no idea what the note meant, but now that I think about it, I seriously think that he had very ill intentions toward me. I'm still angry at myself for even letting a stranger into my home, which is obviously a big mistake. I immediately blocked him on all of my social media. I'm just so lucky I made it out alive. All I know is that he's somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time that I met him, but all I can say now is that I'm glad that he's many miles away from me. I recently just moved into a new apartment with my boyfriend. We'd been living here for a few months now. I was really excited to move out because my old apartment was really old and falling apart. And I also hated my neighbors, so I was really looking forward to moving. When we first moved into the apartment, something seemed off right away from the start. It felt like someone was watching me when I was in the shower, or in a room by myself. Or I would hear footsteps in a room that no one was in. I didn't think much of it, I just thought it was my imagination getting to me, being that I was in a new apartment. Now I don't really believe in the paranormal, but after this incident, I'm starting to believe that we're not the only ones living here. My boyfriend was at work when this happened to me. I'd been watching scary movies all day, so I was a bit scared to be in the new apartment alone. I was sitting on my bed watching a scary movie with my two cats when I heard a knock. I thought it was just in the movie, so I kept watching when I heard it again. Only this time, it was a bit louder. I paused my show and went to go check if my boyfriend got home early, looking to see if I locked him out by accident. I went to check my front door, but he wasn't there. I went back to my room and saw that my cat Nova was looking at something. She was staring the closet with wide eyes. You should know that my cat is a very friendly cat. I'd had her for a year and she's the most lovable cat and has never showed any aggression towards me or my boyfriend. Nova was hissing and meowing very loudly at the closet door. I was really scared after I saw her act this way. I've never seen her act like that before. I just tried to calm her down a bit and pet her the best I could. When I looked over at the closet, I saw it shaking as if someone was holding the door handles really tight. It was like they were shaking it up and down really fast. I was so freaked out at this point, I froze. 
because I couldn't believe what I just saw. It wasn't just me, but both my cats were acting strange. Nova was in the middle of the bed, looking around, still hissing and meowing like crazy. Her head was moving side to side, almost as if someone was walking around the bed. When I told my boyfriend about this, he was a bit freaked out and then he told me that he also felt as if someone was watching him in the shower. I never told him that I also felt that. This encounter happened to a friend and a co-worker of mine about 15 years ago in a suburb of Los Angeles, California. My friend, who we'll call Jody, lived with her parents and older brother in a house in a pretty nice neighborhood. They didn't really worry about crime or break-ins and that kind of thing. One night, though, at about 2 a.m., Jody was woken up by loud knocking at the front door. She jumped out of bed and ran into the hallway, where her parents and brother were coming out of their own rooms. The knocking, now a pounding, continued. Stay here, her father said and he made his way toward the door. All of a sudden, there came a muffled male voice shouting, Help me. Help me. Jody and her mom grabbed each other in fear, and her dad looked out the peephole. There's nobody there, he said. He looked out the front window, where he could see part of the front door and porch. He still didn't see anyone. He walked back towards his family when the loud knocking began again, this time even more frantic. Again, a voice shouted, Help! Help me! Jody's dad went to the phone and called 911, and while he was talking to the operator, her brother had walked up to the front of the house. The pounding was still going on, getting faster and faster until it was a constant banging. Help me! Help me! Oh God, help me! Jody, in tears of fright by now, looked over at her brother, who was standing in the family room which was located to the left of the front door. His face was white. He made an arm gesture for them to join him. Jody, her mom and dad, hurried into the family room, where they immediately realized why her brother's face had gone pale. The pounding and shouting was coming from underneath the family room floor. The police arrived minutes later, and it turned out that some guy in his 20s had gotten all out of his mind on crack that night. He had somehow made his way into the opening of the crawl space under the house, located underneath the family room window. They never found out exactly what his intentions were, but they assume he was trying to find a way into the house to rob it. He then got disoriented because he was so high, and then he freaked out, hence the pounding and shouting. The story gave me goosebumps the first time she told it to me. So I don't live in the greatest area, nor in the nicest apartment, so I'm always checking my surroundings when I'm out and about. Nothing crazy, I'm just being aware of what's going on around me. This being said, the other night I decided that the mountain of dirty clothes inhabiting my closet was bordering, uh, disgusting. It was time to do one of my least favorite chores, laundry. I don't mind doing laundry itself but the laundry room in this building always gives me the creeps. It's in the dank and dark basement of the building. You always have to grope the wall for a light switch. It would really make an excellent location for a horror film, to be honest. So I go down, throw my laundry in the machine. Everything's fine and dandy. I come back 40 minutes later to throw it in the dryer. Nothing out of the usual. Yeah. An hour later, I go back down in the basement to collect my stuff out of the dryer. Well, when I turn on the light, the dryer door is open. My shit is strewn about, all over the ground, and hanging out of the dryer. And to top it all off, they were still wet. Normally, I'd be like, whatever, because sometimes people open dryers and just don't close them. But this really looked like someone rummaged through my stuff. Shrugging this off, I put my stuff back in. And that's when I get a sharp chill running down my back. It was so random. I genuinely felt like I wasn't alone. So I turn around, back to the elevator, 
and all of a sudden I hear the sound of someone frantically running up the stairs on the other side of the room, almost as if they had been spotted. Anyway, I get all my laundry back to my apartment and notice I'm missing some stuff, but at this point I'm kind of creeped out so I'm not in the mood to go snooping around looking for some t-shirts. So I kind of just forgot about it until a couple of days later. I received an email from our landlord telling all the residents that a homeless guy not only broke into the building, but that he also performed sexual acts upon himself in the laundry room, then started a fire and went around the whole building trying to break into people's unlocked apartments. So I'm guessing this guy went through my stuff, probably took something, did God knows what with it, and then started a fire for some reason. So two summers ago, I was hanging out with my boyfriend Adam and our friend Luke. We were planning on going to another friend's house but had some time to kill before they were off of work. Luke mentions kind of suddenly that he forgot that his co-worker Tim gave him money earlier to pick up weed for him, and that he was supposed to go drop it off at Tim's house. First of all, thanks for mentioning that before you got in my car, but I didn't bitch too much and just asked for the address. The GPS directed me to a higher-end gated community on the other side of town. From working at a place that dispatches delivery drivers to this community all the time, I know that you usually need some kind of code or something to get in. But the guard at the front just bust us through with nothing more than a puzzled look when we said we were heading to the Smith house. Weird, but okay, whatever. Then we get to the house. All the lights are off. There are no cars in the driveway. We triple check the address and go to ring the doorbell. No answer. We ring again and still no answer. Luke is trying to call Tim. Adam is trying to call one of the guys Tim said he was hanging out with. I'm peering into the windows, starting to get a bit weirded out. That's when I notice there's no furniture with inside of the front window. The entryway has no coat rack or table. The kitchen at the end of the hall has no table. The sitting room off to the side didn't have any couches or anything. There were pictures hanging on the walls, but they appear to be mostly landscapes or paintings. No family pictures or anything personal. By this time, both the boys announced that no one had answered their calls or messages. I say I think we should leave, and that Luke can give Tim his shit at work the next day. Before I can even start my car, though, Tim messages Adam, not the person he sent on this errand, by the way, and he says, Hey, just go around the back and come in through the basement window when you get here. What? I tell them that's the sketchiest thing I've ever heard, that we should leave, but they insist it's fine, and that's just how Tim sneaks his friends in and out of the house if he doesn't want to wake his dad up. This still makes no sense to me, considering it's like 8pm. Neither of them actually hang out with Tim outside of work, but off we go around the house. At the back of the house, we reach one of those light shafts that are common in lots of houses with basements, the ones that let light down to the underground window and look kind of like a drainage pipe. Basically, my boyfriend drops down this hole and knocks on the window. Tim answers it and says he'll be out in a minute. He then promptly closes the window. Adam climbs back out of the hole and the three of us are standing there waiting. So now, we have three adults standing in the dark backyard of an empty house in a gated community trying to drop off weed to my friend's co-worker. I don't like this at all, but after a minute, Tim and another boy I don't know emerge from the hole. They make the swap and then Tim reaches out to shake my hand and says, Hey, Billy needs a ride home. You got him, right? Again? What? Before I can argue, Adam and Luke say it won't be a problem and offer to give me gas money if I need it. So the four of us pile back into my car. I got a second out of earshot to ask Adam who the hell this kid was. He informs me that Billy's older brothers were two friends of mine at the time. That did ease my mind a bit. Trying to avoid awkward silence, I ask him in the car how his brothers are doing. He simply said, What? I tried to clarify. You know, Ken and Ben. I knew them in high school. Isn't Ken in England or somewhere? And again he responded shortly. 
Oh, yeah, okay. So much for that. But he did direct me back out of the gated community and through the regular neighborhoods, asking to be dropped off at a house a few miles away. While I was never close enough with his brothers to go to their house, I'm relatively positive that they lived in an entirely different neighborhood. And to add to the creep factor, in the two years since, I've gone to Tim's house several times, in an entirely different town. I asked Adam about it one day, and the only explanation I got was that Tim's dad lived in the gated community, but Tim lives with his mother most of the time. I have no idea what was really going on in that house, but I don't think I want to know. In 2007, when I was 12 years old, my family and I took a trip to Key Biscayne, Florida, with some of my cousins and family friends. Naturally, while at the resort, my cousins and I would all hang out at the kids' club, where there were always a bunch of kids to hang out with, epic chicken fingers and ranch dressing, and fun games for us to play. There was a director of the kids' club who watched us and facilitated all the activities. His name was Dan. In retrospect, Dan was a major fucking creep. He was around 40 years old, super tall and skinny, and was balding badly. The worst part is that sometimes he had us call him Dan Dan the Animal Man. For a side note, these sort of memories leave me in awe of how naive and blinded to danger I was as a kid. If I ever met this guy now, I literally wouldn't want to get within a 5 foot radius of him. And there I was as a 12 year old, thinking he rocked. Time is a wonderful thing. Anyhow, I digress. It was made clear to all of us that for unknown reasons, Dan was leaving the hotel in a week. None of this fazed me. On our last day at the hotel, I lost my cell phone. It was a bright blue chocolate cell phone. I quickly told my parents I couldn't find my phone, and considering this was already the second phone I lost that year, my mom yelled at me and told me if I didn't find the phone, I'd be grounded. I hurriedly ran around the hotel looking for my phone, and along my way I went to the kids club to see if anyone had found it. The room that was typically bustling with kids and activity was eerily quiet and empty. Dan was sitting on a couch all by himself. Hey Dan, did you by any chance see my phone? I asked. Dan responded, yes, I found it and put it in the lost and found in the basement. Come with me. Thinking absolutely nothing of this, I mindlessly followed Dan as he led me around the back of the hotel. We walked for about three minutes and arrived at the foot of the stairwell going into the basement. We were standing at the back of the hotel, in a strange area, and no one else was in sight. It's down here? I asked, confused. I was staring down a long flight of stairs leading to absolute darkness. The walls were made of unpainted concrete. It looked no more than a storage area, let alone a basement with the lost and found. Dan nodded and held the door open for me, motioning for me to head down the steps. Something in my 12-year-old self suddenly woke up. I'm not sure if it was instinct, fear, or fucking luck, but I immediately knew I had to get the hell out of there. Before Dan could say or do anything, I blurted out, Never mind, I think I left it with my mom and I darted away from the stairwell and back to the hotel lobby. I was so shaken up because something about that situation didn't feel right. I knew he was going to hurt me, and as a kid who wore rose-colored glasses and was overly trusting of others, this really meant something. I tried to compose myself and figured I'd investigate a bit more. I walked up to the concierge of the hotel and asked them where the lost and found was, because I'd just lost my phone. The nice woman at the front desk told me that Lost and Found was right there, at their desk. She then asked me what kind of phone I lost, and after I told her it was a blue chocolate flip phone, she smiled and pulled it out of the box under her desk. Someone turned it in here earlier, she said, and then she handed me my phone. Wait, you're telling me that Lost and Found isn't in the basement, I stammered. No, sweetie, the hotel is under construction and the basement is just being rebuilt. There's no electricity down there or anything yet. This scared the absolute shit out of me. 
I couldn't shake the feeling that this man was dangerous. At the time I was sharing my hotel room with my cousin, and she was the only person I told. Considering she was 8 at the time, I think I really freaked her out. I am now 26, and I think back to that moment. I wonder what if. What would have happened if I went down in the basement with Dan Dan the Animal Man? It truly feels like one of the most critical junctures of my entire life. I'm so happy I knew to get the hell out of there before it was too late. I recently contacted the hotel to inquire about past kid club employees named Dan from 2007 just to see if he's still around, or on a sex offenders list, or maybe in jail. I even told HR this whole story, but they still refused to give me any information about it. They sounded pretty sketchy about it. I will continue to do research. I was about 13 years old, lived in a quiet, rural lake community. My parents, aunt and uncle were going away for the weekend, so my cousin, who was 15, stayed over at my house for the weekend. He brought over his Xbox and a bunch of games and we stayed up all night playing and chilling in my room. My room was small with a single twin bed, so we ended up sleeping downstairs on the set of couches in the finished basement. I get woken up by my husky at around 8 a.m. She was acting like she needed to go out, but this was strange for her to do. I rubbed my eyes, still half asleep, and started up the stairs to let her out. When I grabbed the doorknob, to my surprise, the door pulled right open. As groggy and dumb as I was, I think to myself, weird, the knob must be broken. I open the door, clip my dog onto her lead, but she won't go out. I coax her out annoyed because I only got a couple of hours sleep, and when I turn to go back inside, I notice the jam is completely destroyed. That's when everything hit me. I have no idea what to do. My cousin is still asleep in the basement. I don't have a cell phone. Are they still in my house? I quietly listen for any kind of movement, then I go back down to the basement and wake my cousin up. We stupidly decide to go up and look through the house. Thank God it was empty. It was also empty of all of our video games, movies, and valuables, and that kind of thing. I call 911, then my parents. Police arrive, but they don't do much of anything except say, tough luck. It took me a few hours to settle down, when I finally realized that the fact that this person or people watched me while I slept, had we stayed in a small room with a creaky door, I almost certainly would have woken up and faced the intruders. My life could be very different. It still gives me the chills 16 years later. When I was around 7 years old, my parents rented out our basement to a young couple. Things went smoothly for the first couple of months for the most part save for the occasional loud party here or there. They were nice enough and would even leave their door open for my siblings and I to wander in and out of and use their basketballs, badminton rackets, and that kind of thing whenever they were home. They would let us come and go as we pleased, although we didn't do it so very often because my parents weren't comfortable with the idea, of course. As time went on, they started getting a bit out of hand, throwing loud parties until all hours of the night and disturbing the neighbors. Sketchy people coming in and out. My parents suspected they were growing marijuana in the basement, as the house constantly smelled like weed all throughout. My parents did end up finding a plant being grown in the closet under a lamp, and they evicted them immediately. This was when weed wasn't legal at the time. A few years went by until a family member, who works in corrections, came over one day. They began talking to my mom about our former tenants. They asked us if we ever knew where they ended up and she said she didn't. The family member then told us that a man was brought into the facility that they worked at, who looked and sounded familiar because they weren't able to place him. They suspected that the man may be our ex-tenant, who was actually being held on charges of sexual assault and murder, but they aren't sure if it was him or not. Eventually, my mom was able to confirm the identity of the man as being our ex-tenant, 
He was arrested for assaulting and murdering his ex-girlfriend with his father. My parents didn't tell us this until years later, but it was pretty wild news considering how many times he had invited my siblings and I without hesitation into the basement whenever we were out playing in the yard. So a couple of days ago, I woke up around 4.20 to our fire alarm going off in our house. This is not a normal fire alarm either. It's a piercing, extremely loud one that even our neighbors can hear in their house four houses down. So I bolted awake and woke up my boyfriend to let him know as well. I went to the panel downstairs to turn it off, and I saw that it said there was smoke in the basement. Okay, no big deal. It's happened once before, and it was mostly just a false alarm that time. So I put in the coat to turn it off. This all took about five minutes, because my sleep-deprived brain couldn't remember it. So I had to look it up on my phone. I know I need to check the basement to make sure everything was okay. I grabbed a kitchen knife just in case, and because I'm a slightly paranoid person, plus being startled awake already had me on edge. So there are two ways to get to the basement. You can go outside and go through the cellar doors, and an additional locked door to get in, or take the elevator down in the house. Our landlord, whom we live with, put in the elevator when he bought it for his family that were in wheelchairs. It's basically the size of a closet, and has a small gate that you slide close for a door. So I took the elevator to the basement, opened the gate, and when I went to open the door to the basement, I turned the knob but it felt like someone was holding onto it on the other side so it wouldn't turn. I immediately let go, slammed the gate to the elevator shut, and pressed to go to the second floor where our bedroom is. When I get up there, my boyfriend sees me and asks me what's wrong. I'm literally standing there with wide eyes in my bathrobe, clutching a huge knife to my chest. I told him what happened. He immediately gets up and says to stay there. Thankfully, the fire department arrived a minute later, so he and our landlord went to go talk to them. They went down to the basement, both through the elevator and through the cellar, but there was no one down there. However, our back gate was open, and we know it was closed before we had taken the trash out earlier. They didn't find anything, and the next day we went through together and made sure everything was locked. But now I'm just dealing with the fact of what could have happened if I had tried to force the door open, or if the person down there hadn't thought to grab it. I've never been great at being concise, but sharing this is helping me feel a little less anxious. A few years ago, my mother asked if I would go to her house and let the exterminator in. She told me not to leave him alone and to follow him around the house and ask questions. I wasn't sure what kind of questions she meant, but sure, I can open a door and follow someone around the house and annoy them. So the exterminator arrives and I follow him from room to room, asking whatever questions came to mind. Stuff like, have you been getting a lot of calls for stink bugs? Did you ever need to get a rabies shot? What's the largest thing you ever had to exterminate? For an hour, I followed this man around while he patiently answered my ridiculous questions. He said he enjoyed our conversation. Two days later, I'm watching the news, and I see that the body of a local doctor was found bound in her basement. Her corpse was lit on fire. The very next day, the news flashes a photo of the man arrested for the murder. He looks very familiar to me, and then I get a full body chill. It turns out the doctor was having an issue with mice and called an exterminator. The same one my mother called. The day after I asked this man, what's the largest thing you ever had to exterminate? He apparently snapped because the doctor was rude. She asked too many questions and talked down to him. Many years ago, I got my first bachelor apartment. It was a basement unit in a two-story walk-up on the edge of my town's campus. So naturally, it was an eclectic mix of wealth and poverty. I was somewhat closer to the ladder. 
This place was tiny, with a mattress on the floor against one wall. I could lie on the floor, feet against the edge of my mattress, and touch the far wall with my fingertips. So there wasn't much space. The kitchenette was to the right of the apartment door, and there was a tiny bathroom in the back. One night, at around 4am, I heard growling. And because my apartment was so small, and I was so close to the apartment door, and because it was so dark, it sounded like the growling was inside of my apartment. It sounded like there was an angry, hurt animal growling on the other side of my living room, and in the pitch black, that was truly terrifying. I lay there under my blankets, terrified. The growling went on for almost 30 minutes and would get louder and more angry, then taper off a bit, then get louder, angrier, and higher pitched, like a wail or a shriek, and then stop. Finally, I heard the scratching on my door and the growling stopped. There was nobody in my apartment. Never was. It was my next door neighbor, and apparently she believed she was possessed. She did this a few more times. She would lie on the floor outside my apartment door in the hallway, out of sight from my people so I couldn't see her. I could only hear her growling and speaking something that wasn't English. It was always well into the night. I had no phone, and ours were the only apartments in the basement, as the rest of it was for the furnace and water heaters and storage. So when I wanted to go out, I had to pass her apartment, which started becoming a bad time. Every time I needed to leave home, it got to the point where I had to tiptoe past her door, because if she heard me, she would rush to her front door and start banging on it, shrieking and cursing until I was far enough away that I could not hear her. I spoke with the landlord about it, and he said she was. Fine. She was a lovely, quiet woman who mostly kept to herself. Of course, because we were the only tenants on that floor, nobody else heard what was going on, so it was her word against mine. About a month after speaking with the landlord about her, she set fire to her apartment cooking toast. She just put bread on the burner and forgot about it and set a small fire. Nobody was badly hurt. The building was evacuated and she went to the hospital with smoke inhalation, but she was released the next day. When they went in to assess the damage, they discovered that she'd written on every square inch of her apartment walls in small, neatly written cursive handwriting, vaguely religious scripture-style verses, apparently in an attempt to keep the demons contained. I moved out at the end of that month and never looked back. I heard through a friend that she was diagnosed with a severe schizophrenic disorder. She was put on a heavy course of medication to deal with it. To this day, I wouldn't know her if I passed her in the street. I never once saw the woman who became feral and laying on the ground shrieking outside my apartment door. I only heard her. And she scared the living shit out of me. In 2019, me, my boyfriend, my best friend and her partner, stayed at an Airbnb in Sandusky, Ohio for a convention. There were several red flags about the place, but it was much cheaper than a hotel near the convention hall, so we opted for there. The first red flag happened as soon as we arrived. The owner greeted us and made a point to tell us that his house was directly next door, as in, if there weren't any trees he would have been able to see into the windows of where we were staying. Okay, so he had a few houses on his property. No big deal, right? Wrong. It only got worse from here. Per instruction, we were forbidden to go into the basement under any circumstances, unless there was a tornado. Being the curious young adults we are, we opened the door anyway and we were going to investigate. We stopped in our tracks as soon as we saw the direction the stairs were facing directly towards the owner's home. In the darkness, there was a faint electronic glow. We quickly shut the door and barricaded it with luggage. Again, the owner's home was so close, there could have easily been something connecting his house to the basement. A little weirded out at this point, we went and looked at the rest of the house. It was a nice and spacious place with a narrow staircase to the second floor, where our bedrooms would be. We selected our rooms and began to unwind after the long drive. In my boyfriend and I's room, there was a single random sprinkler in the middle of the ceiling. It looked out of place. 
We were tired from the trip, so I didn't think much of it back then. But looking back now, there's a high chance it was a hidden camera. Things only got weirder from here. We were gone most of the day at the convention, and when we returned, one of the outside doors that was definitely locked was unlocked, and it was slightly ajar. My friends and I collectively shared a look of panic and closed and locked the door. My best friend's partner suggested that maybe the owner needed to get something out of there while we were gone, and it's possible he didn't close the door completely on the way out. We made sure all of our things were still there, and then we soon forgot about it because we discovered something more pressing. The locks on both bedroom doors were now ineffective. We told ourselves that they were already like that and we just didn't notice it, but I'm not sure if I believe that. On our second to last night, my boyfriend and I were both restless over what had been happening at the Airbnb and the day's activities, so we decided to try to find something to watch on TV to take our minds off of it. We were flipping through the channels of the TV, when suddenly we came across a Windows 10 lock screen, and no computer in sight. I opened the cabinets and looked around trying to find a computer. The dresser the TV was on was too heavy to move to look behind, but seeing where the wires were positioned, they could have very well gone through the wall and into the basement. We were too frightened to see the basement for ourselves to confirm or deny our suspicions of surveillance and the owner's interference and who knows what else. Needless to say, we left as quickly as possible the last day there, and we did not look back. So this happened a few months ago. I'm a sophomore in college and was traveling down to my hometown over break. I was having some relationship issues with my stepmom, so I didn't want to stay at my dad's house the night I arrived at my hometown. So I phoned a friend of mine from high school and asked if I could stay at his place. I knew from social media that he was still in town, and I have stayed at his place before, so I knew there would be a place for me to stay if they would allow it. My friend, who we'll call Z, seemed like a pretty normal guy. We weren't best friends or anything, but we got pretty close by the time we graduated. We would occasionally text or hang out if I was in town and catch up, reminisce on the times we spent in orchestra or in English class. When I called, he seemed extremely enthusiastic. Z's a normally upbeat guy, but this time it seemed like he was getting a brand new car. I didn't think about it at the time. He said I could sleep in the guest room, so I headed over. When I got to his house, he was just as excited as he was on the phone. He was bringing up stuff to do, like getting high and watching weird movies or playing video games. Z's parents weren't home, so he really wanted the opportunity to smoke. I was pretty tired from the drive, but since we rarely see each other, I thought a bit of bonding couldn't hurt. We played Smash Bros, smoked some weed, and just chatted for hours. It was longer than I wanted. But I was having fun, so whatever, right? By the time it was getting late, at around 2am, he started asking some pretty weird questions, like if I ever wondered what it was like to kill someone, or if I thought anyone would miss me if I was gone. This, along with some pretty normal questions, like if I had a boyfriend, or how my parents are doing, or if I'm making any friends at school, gave me such a weird feeling. I was confused in the moment but it didn't hit me until after that Z could be assessing me for something bad. The weirdness of it all made me just want to go to bed. We stopped the game and both went into the basement where his room and the guest room were. We say goodnight. I go to my room and get ready for bed. I'm having trouble sleeping, just insomnia that I've had for a while, so I stay awake for around an hour until I hear some movement outside my room. The walls were pretty thin, so I could hear footsteps walking past my door and up the stairs to the main floor, then back down quickly after. What struck me as odd was that I didn't hear the basement door open. It creaks when it opens. The light didn't turn on, so I was confused what Z was doing. I heard him go back to his room, but I had this odd feeling just ever since I met him this night. He seemed a lot different than he's ever been. I decided to look him up on social media and Google to see anything out of the ordinary. Everything seemed normal, until I found his Tumblr. It was linked to his inactive Twitter account that I found on my Twitter contact list. 
His tumbler was, well, disturbing. There were graphic drawings of mutilated bodies of humans and animals, links to suspicious looking websites that I didn't dare click on, posts and stories about murdering, cannibalism, and torture. There were photos of guns, knives, and axes, which after looking closely, were all taken in his bedroom. The last post, around a week prior, was a text post from the account, saying he wished he could find someone easy to kill like a homeless person. I was immediately filled with dread. I knew he was going to do something. He must have gone up the stairs to lock the door. I packed all my things, and luckily I packed lightly. I then opened a small window at the top of the bedroom's wall. I started desperately climbing through, and as I was pulling my legs through, he opened the door. It was dark, but the streetlight illuminated enough for me to see he was carrying something long and skinny. So it was probably a knife. He didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just turned around, hopped in my car, and drove as fast as I could to my dad's house. I immediately blocked him everywhere and reported his Tumblr account, but not before telling the police. They said they couldn't do anything as the guns were registered under his dad, and he hasn't actually done anything yet. Nevertheless, I told my other high school friends not to hang out with Z anymore. Ever since then, I've been creeped out whenever I meet new people. Just the realization that someone I knew so well could underneath be this person who could hurt me so bad. Who could kill me? I don't know what you're doing now, Z. I'm not sure I even want to know. But I hope you're getting help. I lived in a multi-high-rise apartment complex near Ventura, Miami, Florida, during college around 2004 to 2006. I'm a female, and at the time I was 18 to 20. It was my first time living on my own in a city away from my family. These two things that happened still creep me out to this day. So here's the first thing that happened. I lived on the 14th floor in an open-concept studio apartment. It had a small balcony with a sliding glass door that would look into the main living area that was basically my living room bedroom with the galley kitchen and bathroom in the background. There was also a small hallway leading to my front door in between them and connecting the entire space. Two girls my age moved into the studio next to me. They seemed off. They always wore sunglasses, never said hi when I said hi, and just gave off a bad vibe. After a couple of months, I noticed the girls were gone. Three men around their 30s started going in and out of the apartment a lot. They also gave off very creepy vibes, always staring in the hallway, but not speaking. It was just weird. Often I would be up all night watching Sex in the City DVDs I rented from Blockbuster while I sat on my couch working on projects for school. I would sometimes leave the vertical blind slightly turned to allow light and just see the skyline while working. One week, my mom came to visit me and was in the kitchen. She said to me, I swear I just saw someone go onto your balcony and then jump back over. Me being a kid and just stressed about school was like, yeah, whatever, it's probably nothing, and then moved on. My mom ended up getting a piece of wood to put in the door frame so no one could open it from the outside. About two months after that, my mom and grandmother came to visit a couple of days and they decide one night to go to a casino nearby. It's about 10 to 11 p.m. at night. I don't go because I'm working on a project for school. About 15 minutes after they leave, I hear rustling by my front door. I slowly move to check the peephole as inconspicuously as possible. I see one of the creeps from next door off to the side of my door, using his right arm to hold himself on my door frame while looking downward. My heart drops and I remember my face getting really flushed with anxiety. It felt hot. As I'm standing there, thinking where my phone is at and what I should do, I start to hear my sliding glass door behind me begin to move. It was locked so it just slightly moved back and forth. As I said, I keep my blinds slightly open, but in a way where I can see the person, but they most likely couldn't see me. It was the other guy from the same apartment. At this point, it doesn't take too much to assume that they are at least trying to scare me, and at most, wanting to harm me. 
They knew my family had left. My phone is on the couch and I'm too scared to move towards the sliding glass door. I didn't want this person to see me get the phone. As I'm standing there, all of a sudden sheets of white computer paper start being flung under my door into the apartment hallway. They were literally blank sheets of paper. And then the door handle starts going up and down. Right now I'm in fight or flight and I can't take flight, so I'm just waiting for the guy at the door to kick it in. My only thought was to grab this large carving knife my mom gave me for protection in situations like this. I duck down and get it from the drawer and just hide around the corner in the kitchen. I aim this knife in my hand at the same height where I assumed his juggler would be. And all I knew was as soon as the door was kicked open, I would count to two and then start stabbing. I can still feel the tightness in my chest. I was breathing so fast and heavy I thought I was going to black out. The next thing I hear was the elevator open. I hear my mom and grandmother talking, and then the key start to go into the door. My mom opens it and screams because I'm standing there terrified with a knife, ready to stab her. We called the complex security and I called Miami PD. Then later in the week I saw the maintenance workers taking up furniture and appliances. It was like these guys just vanished. I never saw them again. A couple with a new baby moved in. It was truly one of the scariest situations I've ever been in. I really feel that if my family wouldn't have come back early, something terrible would have happened. And now for the second story. Again, I'm still in college. I would stay at labs and such as I got near finals so often. I would have to park behind my building but in front of the other building in the complex. Each building has a front and back entrance with a kind of drive up with the concrete awning built into the building. Above it is the center windows where the elevator hallway is, so if you felt so inclined, you could jump out the window and walk around on this awning. I park in the back of my apartment, about halfway to the other building, and I see, as plain as day, a gorilla suit. A full-size, full-formed, hair and pecs and shaped gorilla. I stare at it for a moment and nope out of there. I watch a lot of horror movies and, well, this is the beginning of one. It's weird, but I think someone's just playing a prank. Over the next few weeks, it's sometimes there and sometimes not. The guy I was dating at the time saw it too. We just kind of laughed it off and thought it was creepy and weird. One night, I get home around 2am. There was no parking in the front, so I had to head to the back. The gorilla is there. That night just fell off. I felt very uneasy and something seemed different about it. I attempted to park as close as I could to my back entrance. I get out of the car and as said, something just freaked me out more tonight about this gorilla suit. I have to get my supplies out of the back seat, so I try to keep checking on the gorilla as I'm getting my stuff out. This 100% happened, God is my witness. This thing starts walking and jumps off the awning, and without missing a beat, starts booking it straight towards me. I was in shock. I stood there for a beat or two, thinking what's going on. I then just started running as fast as I could to my back door. I didn't even turn around, I just ran. I got inside the lobby and started slamming the elevator buttons. I can't see anything, no one's around and I'm starting to panic and cry and freak out. Finally the elevator opens up, and like a movie, I get inside and hit the closed door like 50 times, and that's it. I get into my apartment. Nothing happened. I didn't see that gorilla again. No clue what, why, or how. Needless to say, I moved out after this. Weirdest apartment I've ever lived in since. I don't know if I attract weird shit, but I do have a lot of other stories, mostly based in paranormal or unexpected type of stuff. Thank you for listening, and be careful out there. It's around 12.30am. I go outside to throw the garbage and the first thing I see is this 20-ish year old woman facing the corner of the wall outside of the house. The only thing I see is her long black hair that's reaching her lower back. She was wearing a short black leather skirt and a sleeveless blouse. It was quite cold outside so I was wondering if she was alright. 
She wasn't crying. She was not sad. She was not waiting for anyone. She was just quiet. Hey, can I help you? I ask. No response. Are you waiting for someone? Again? Nothing. Are you okay? She didn't budge or make a single noise. I wanted to tap her shoulder and get to the bottom of this, but I decided to do that after I put away the garbage. I walked around the corner, and when I came back, she was gone. My porch was clear. She obviously did not pass me, so she must have gone the other way. And to be honest with you, I was just glad she was gone and nothing else happened. I go inside of my house, lay in my bed as it is late at night, and I remembered one very important thing. The street was empty on the other side. No one was there. That meant there was only one place this woman had gone into. My house. I immediately grab a hunting knife that I received as a gift for my 18th birthday. I head out in search for this stranger in my home. I walk around silently checking every room, under every table, inside every closet, and even in the basement. As I'm walking up the stairs, I hear quick and heavy footsteps running. I rush to the scene trying to catch up with this person and confront her. I check my surroundings. Everything seems okay. I find the front door open and the wind whistling through the gap. I go outside and I see this woman in the distance, running away, fading into the darkness. She never came back. I never saw her again. Thankfully nothing was stolen, and more importantly, no one was hurt. For a bit of context, I'm a single female in my 30s. I live alone apart from my pets. I am on my own when it comes to my safety. So this happened last summer. It was around 11pm and I was sitting at my dining room table typing away on my final paper of the semester. Behind me sits my kitchen and a big window that overlooks my backyard. This backyard was surrounded completely by a 6 foot vinyl privacy fence. And inside that fence was a small garden I'd been working hard on. Lots of cute flowers and a little pond. I was proud of it and would leave the blinds open so I could take in all my hard work during the day. I was caught up in my paper that was due by midnight. And since it was late, the dogs were snoozing away nearby. My concentration was broken by a very sudden, very loud, and very deliberate tapping right behind me. I froze completely. It also dawned on me I'd never closed my blinds. All of my interior lights were on, and we know how that works. Whoever was tapping could see me perfectly. Weirdly and inconveniently enough, my dogs, who normally bark the slightest noise, were still sound asleep. It took me about five minutes to muster the slightest ounce of courage to turn my head, just enough to see the window in my periphery only to hear a loud crunch and another couple of taps, just a bit lighter. No, fuck that. There was no need to look. The last thing I needed to see was a face pressed up against that window. To my left was a door to the carport, which led to the backyard. The handle was within arm's reach, and I wouldn't have to look at the window to open it. I called to my dogs and they jumped up as soon as I turned the knob. I guess the watcher realized what I did. About 30 seconds passed and I heard a couple more crunches, then followed by a very loud thud. If you've ever heard a vinyl fence being smacked against, it's a bit distinctive, and I knew they jumped it. My dogs finally went nuts and I ran to the window near the thud. I caught a quick glimpse of a leg disappearing behind the corner of my neighbor's house. I stayed up until dawn with my metal baseball bat and one of those giant sharp grill forks. With the fence and dogs, I always felt safe. How they got back there so quietly, I'll never know. I've lived here my whole life and never had anything happen, so this has shaken me. Whoever that was wanted me to know that they were there, and they definitely wanted my attention. I've since installed multiple cameras and motion lights all around the perimeter of my house. It's been quite a while since. I feel better, 
but that illusion of safety has all but disappeared. I'm a 26-year-old male. I just quit my job to stay at home with my children while my wife works. Today is the second day I've been home with my children, a one-year-old and a five-year-old. We were eating lunch and I heard a loud knock on my front door. Living in a rough neighborhood, I answer my door with a gun every time. I open the door and there's a single guy on my porch. He's covered in tattoos. His face, neck hands and basically everything. I have tattoos myself, but something about his behavior and appearance together made me uncomfortable. He asks me if he can come in and use the restroom and use my cell phone. Of course I say no, because I don't know him. He starts to get agitated and starts yelling, so I point my gun at him and tell him to fuck off. As he walks off my porch, I'm watching him and someone else comes walking out of the back of my driveway. I stepped outside and told them that if they come back, I will shoot them both. I don't know what they really wanted, but I refuse to let anything happen to my children. I understand that murder is wrong, but I value the lives of my children more than anything else. I will not hesitate to defend their lives with lethal force. This happened when I was about 14 to 15, and I'm now 19. I was in my house's basement playing PlayStation absentmindedly late into the night, like I often did at the time. Being up until 3 to 4 a.m. was not unusual for me at the time. How my house is structured, it has a front door, but also a second set of front doors if you're down the driveway. The basement is by these second doors. As I was getting ready to log off for the night, I heard my dog start going crazy from upstairs. They sometimes bark at nothing, a car passing in the night or too much wind whipping past their window. However, as someone who listened to too many scary stories, that was more than enough for me. I went upstairs and was about to go straight to my room when I caught a glimpse of movement out of a window. I looked through the window to my front yard, but I couldn't see anything. Suddenly I heard my dad yell in a voice lower than his own. Hey, can I help you? This is what set me into pure adrenaline mode. I stood frozen, staring out the window, as my ears strained to hear the guy's response. I still got nothing, before my dad continued. Sorry, you have the wrong house. Get off of my property. Here he comes back into the sideline. A man wearing a white sleeveless shirt and cargo pants. I watched as he walked off our front path and onto the street, and then back onto the path. He was seemingly unsure of where to go and what to do. It was now I realized with utter dread, I didn't lock the downstairs front door. I finally break my frozen spell and run back down the stairs. I then lock the front door. I take a deep breath and start back toward the stairs when I hear it. It was the door handle jiggling. I didn't even look back. I book it to the top of the stairs into my parents' room. My dad had already called the cops. They came and about half an hour later, they seemingly picked up a man from an empty house down the street that was in the process of being sold. The following day the newspaper told of an escaped convict from the max security prison here. Some sort of mix-up was made and they let out the wrong person. They caught him luckily enough, but didn't detail where. And that is how I both forgot and remembered my way through a creepy encounter. I came home from work today to receive some very unsettling news from one of my roommates. It started when I went to let the dogs out into the backyard. Our back door is in the kitchen, so on my way to let them out, I passed by the oven and noticed it was on. It surprised me a bit because my roommate, Mandy, was the only other person home. 
She'd been spending most of her time back in her room due to feeling unwell. Even so, I figured I'd better ask her first before turning it off, on the off chance that she was actually using the oven. I went to the end of the hallway where her room was, knocked on her door, and asked, Hey, uh, is the oven supposed to be on? Like, are you using it right now? Confusion and concern was immediately apparent in her voice, as she replied, What? No, I haven't even been into the kitchen today. I shared her confusion and concern upon hearing this, but then I pondered the possibility that Carl, her brother and our other roommate, had been the one to leave it on by mistake. I asked her if this could be the case, and she told me that Carl was still at work. He had been there since early that morning. This was when she and I began to piece together that something very strange had to have happened. I told her that I had just gotten home a few minutes prior. It was a bit after 3 p.m. at that point. I had left the house about 7.30 that morning. She then informed me with horrific realization that at around 11 a.m. she had heard noises coming from the living room, including a woman's voice, a chair moving, and the front door opening. She didn't realize at the time that I was at work, so she just assumed it was me and didn't think much of it. She then mentioned that in hindsight, though, the dogs were barking an unusual amount during this time. I asked her how long the noises coming from the living room went on. She said that it was hard to tell because she was trying to sleep at the time, but that if she had to guess, they lasted about 20 minutes. Mandy, Carl, and I are the only current residents of this home, and as mentioned before, Carl and I both worked during that time frame, so Mandy was the only person who reasonably should have been in the house. I thanked her for informing me of this, and then I went back down to the front half of the house. I did a quick comb of the area to check for anything else that looked out of place or missing. I didn't discover anything else out of the ordinary. Nothing else has come of it. So quite a number of years ago, my cousin and I were on summer break at our house playing 007 on the GameCube and passing the time when we heard what sounded like broken glass on tile. The TV was up pretty loud so we paused it, tensely waiting for another sound. Then we heard the sound of flip-flop sandals walking around in the kitchen area. So my cousin called her mom. She asked her mom, who was a nurse, if she was home from work yet. She, of course, was not home yet. She wanted to know why we were asking. Once we told her, she told us to crawl out the window and run to the neighbors as quickly as we could, while she called the police. The bedroom window luckily led to the backyard just next to the gate, so we got out of there. Fast forward an hour or so, and the cops informed my aunt that there had been an obvious break-in. The window on the back door had been broken. There was a note left for my aunt. Now my aunt had recently gotten into a serious relationship with this super nice guy. We'll call him Josh. Well, Josh's ex-wife, however, was not so nice. She had, at some point, followed my aunt home and found where she lived. She then proceeded to break in through the back door, rummage through a bunch of stuff, and leave a horrible note for my aunt. I can imagine what it said. From what I heard, she was arrested. I'm not sure if any charges were pressed. But she later ended herself, leaving behind a daughter and a son, whom I both went to school with. I also later found out that she suffered from severe bipolar disorder and a couple of other things. Tragic, but I'm glad me and my cousin weren't caught up in her psychotic episode more than what we were. It still freaks me out to think about it. So I'm a French student and I study at a university in the UK. It's a campus university, meaning that the university and all its affiliated buildings are centered in an area outside of the city. As a second year student, I live in the nearest town to the campus, which is about 20 minutes away by bus or car. The town I live in is relatively nice, even though the north part is much safer and nicer than the south. Me and my seven roommates live in a 10 bedroom house in the north side, 
Even though it is a relatively nice town, it is known for sketchy people sometimes hanging around anywhere in the town, and there is an alarming amount of crime for such a small town. However, I was never too worried until now. A couple of weeks ago, I was coming home from a coffee date with a friend of mine. I was on my way home, across the street to my doorstep, and as I was pulling my keys out of my pocket, a guy interrupted me. I turned around and a man was standing there. He was probably 5 foot 10 or something, around 23 years old and wasn't too built honestly. At first I thought he was a delivery man because one of my roommates was expecting an Amazon order she asked me to get for her. He started to talk, saying, Sorry for bothering you. I saw you walking from over there, crossing the street. You have something attractive in your walk. At this point, I just assumed he was some random person trying to flirt with me. He then asks me, Are you Spanish? It is a question I get often, and this man didn't look harmful, so I answered him, No, I'm French. He then tried to engage a conversation with me by asking how long I've been in the UK for, why I speak good English, and what do I study. At this point, I just thought it was super sketchy, so I was half answering his questions desperately wanting to get inside the house. Suddenly this man asks me, is this a house of all girls? This is what alarmed me. Why would he even ask that to a random girl? So I replied with the truth. No, we are four boys and four girls. He then seemed quite unsettled and asks me if I know a friend of his that used to live here last year. I just say, no. He then says he'll leave me to it and to take care and have a good day. And he finishes with, I'll see you soon. I'm not one to panic easily, but when I went inside, I immediately went to my roommates. We'll call them Brooke and Mia. I told them what had happened. As I finish my story, Mia looks at Brooke and then back to me, and I just know something was up. Then Mia says, Two days ago, I was coming back from the store, and I could sense that someone was following me. At some point, he came up to me, and he matched exactly the description from the guy who was just here. Mia, Brooke, and I were just plain worried at this point. Mia said, he wanted to talk to me, and wouldn't listen when I asked him to leave me alone, because I have a boyfriend. He left once I shut the door in his face. This meant that this man, assuming it is the same man, followed Mia to this house. He was also hanging around this place when I came home. When the four boys came home, we told them all about it, just to make sure that if anything were to occur to us, there was a backstory. Every time I leave the house and come back now, I look around to see if the man is there. We didn't see him until a couple of days ago. We received an alert from the students' union, saying that a young woman had disappeared in the south of the town, they suspected a kidnapping. They were urging everyone to be careful. We didn't hear much about it for a couple of days, until they found the woman's body near the riverside one morning. A couple of hours later, they caught the guy and released his picture. It was the man who was at my doorstep. I don't think what happened has entirely sunk in, but it's still disturbing to know that a poor woman could have been me, or possibly my roommate. Even though the man has been caught, I still look around my block whenever I leave home or when I get back. When I was in 7th grade, my parents had just started letting me stay home alone. Usually it was only for about an hour or so at most, so when I came down with the flu that fall, I thought it would be great just to be home all day alone. My mom instantly said no because it wasn't safe for me at that age to be home alone all day. Well, 20 minutes and a good argument later, I convinced her not to call my grandma to come over and sit with me. I got given the common place, don't answer the door, don't answer the phone, and don't let anyone know you're here alone lecture, and then everyone left. In no time, I gathered up my pillows and blankets made myself a cup of tea and got some crackers, and set up camp in front of the flat screen. I then quickly dozed off, watching all the trashy daytime TV I could handle. 
We'd had a glass ornament with these little colored bubbles in it that would sink and tell you what temperature it was. I don't know exactly what to call it other than some sort of thermometer. Anyways, it was hanging up on our front patio, and hearing it fall and shatter on the floor woke me up. I sat upright immediately and listened for a minute. I started hearing scraping on the screen door around where the doorknob was, and I immediately started sweating. When the doorknob was finally opened, whoever was on the other side slammed into the wooden door, trying to break it down. After about two slams, I jumped up and tried to hide behind the couch, but I got stuck. My ribs were above the couch while everything below was behind. Slam three and some wiggling, and I was just stuck worse. Slam four, the door flew open. I was face to face with a very large man in camo pants and a jacket. We both froze for what felt like forever, but it was probably about 30 seconds. Then before I could stop myself, I began screaming bloody murder. Thank God it scared the guy as he took off running. When I finally got out from behind the couch, I grabbed the house phone. I called my stepdad in a panic. My stepdad hung up on me, which caused me to panic even more. I hid in my bathroom and locked the door until I heard my stepdad and mom and a few other voices outside the door. When I opened up, my parents and two police officers were standing in the living room. I of course explained to them what happened and answered all the questions. From what the cops told us, there were a few break-ins in the area, and what they think happened is the man thought nobody was home, and that's why he tried to break in. As far as I know, the police looked around the neighborhood but never found the guy. So camo man who tried to break into my house. I'm so glad we never met again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you have a story you'd like me to feature on the channel, you can send it to my email. Or if you have a Reddit, submit it on my subreddit. You'll find the details in the video description below. I'll pin a comment too. Do me a favor and leave a like and comment. Subscribe if you haven't. And hit the bell icon and turn on notifications so you can stay up to date with my latest videos. If you fancy checking out my Patreon channel membership, all my links are in the description below. And as usual, I want to thank my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Chris and Donna, Cassie Fowler, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, B Nick, Lil Smart, Do It, K, Something Edgy, Pretty Girl 215, Borderline Betty, Sarah C, Blazed Goddess, Christopher, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Absinthe Alice, Rochelle, Astara Ray, Monique, Crafty Kell, Monica Level Ace, Emma, Sean Gorman, Jennifer L, Skittles MM, Gabrielle, Serafina Nightingale, Jennifer C, Misanthropia, Fluby, Ryan, Brenda, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 05, Linda, Sham, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I hope you guys enjoyed that and are doing well. I'll see you in the next one.